Morning, gentlemen. My name is Captain Nick Savine. I run a six-pack charter boat out of Ocean Southern, New York, called No Time Charters. A lot of you are familiar with me. Some of you are not. Uh, we've been doing it for almost 30 years right now. Um, 25 of them full-time and about five or six part-time. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about blackfish. And, sea bass. and it's mainly going to be blackfish, and I'm going to say that because the sea bass is a pretty easy fish to catch. Uh, you know, the blackfish requires a lot of technique and a lot more skill. Uh, we will touch on the sea bass also, but it'll be mainly geared on the blackfish. Vince kind of surprised me with the sea bass thing, but, you know, I can make an overview of that and get you started on that too in the right direction. Tell you a couple little tricks that I use to catch them that, that are helpful. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the setup, the anchoring, okay? Uh, there's a lot of facets to good black fishing. Anchoring is a very important one. Um, you know, they're more structure oriented than some of the other fish, so location is key. Um, I have a twin anchor system on my boat, which gives me a distinct advantage over boats with a single anchor. But, you know, before we installed the double anchor system, we caught more fish back then on single anchor than we do now. Why? There was more fish around back then, plain and simple. So it became a lot more technical as the years went by. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about is the setup, the anchoring uh, first. Um, when we're talking about anchoring, uh, what we want to do when we first get to an area that we're going to be fishing, okay, um, what we want to do is we want to determine what type of drift we have, okay, uh, which will determine what type of lay we have on our anchor. So, okay, for instance, you get to a drop, you cruise up to it, you look around with it on the machine, you find it, okay, if you got GPS, which everybody has now, you, you've got a little dot there. Years ago, we didn't have that, but anyway, another story. You, you see the dot where you want to sit, okay, so get right on top of that, get the boat motionless, okay. Uh, you don't want the boat to be going fast forward when you sit on that drop. You want it, the boat to be stationary right on top of it and then allow it to drift off. It can take five, ten minutes sometimes. The less wind you have, the longer it takes. But you need to get a direction, a lay direction. So let's say you sit on your point and you drift off, um, let's say you got a light south wind without any current, so you're drifting 180 degrees south to north, okay. You want ideally for good anchoring, you want a 0.5 or better, which is a half a knot or better. Um, for me, ideal would probably be about 0.8. Uh, once you get over 1.0, then you, it may be a, lot, a, kind of, a good amount of wind, which is never helpful. I mean, it, it, you know, you're going to be bouncing around a lot. The less you bounce, the easier they are to catch. We'll get into that later. So let's say you got a 180 degree lay, okay? If you're dropping one anchor, you want to run up 180 degrees, you know, in front of the lay. Let's say you're in 60 feet of water, okay? In 60 feet of water, which is a, an average depth for the blackfish, I would lay out at least 200 feet of line. I want to give it at least three to one. Uh, you can increase that amount of run upwards if you don't have a proper setup. And what I mean by a proper setup is um, I like to use as thin an anchor line as I can get away with. Because you use a heavier anchor line, what happens is you have more water resistance and it'll tend to make you drag the anchor more. Um, I don't use a big length of chain on my anchors. I use maybe four feet, but I use an extremely sharp, well-digging anchor. Um, West Marine makes it. It's a performance anchor, I believe. Moderately expensive. Not as expensive as a, excuse me, a, um, a high tensile, but a lot better than those U.S. anchors, those big clunky ones, those things you want to avoid. If you use an anchor like that, you've got to lay out way more scope than you should need to. What you want to do is keep the scope as short as possible, so use a, th a thinner anchor line. The other good thing about using a thinner anchor line is if you hang on something and you want to rip it out, the line will break before something on your boat. Okay, so my suggestion is 3 8 inch line for almost any size boat up to you know, 35, 40 feet. Mine's a 34 and I use three eighths. I've been using it for years. Okay, let's say we're going for most of your purposes, we're going with one anchor. So we're going to run up 180 in 60 feet of water, at least 200 feet. You can increase the amount of scope or amount of line you let out if you have a rough day when you got a lot of wind or you got a lot of current because that'll make you come back a little faster. 
On a, on a normal condition, it's a, a three to one for me. You know, three, maybe even four to one, okay? So once you get set up, um, with one anchor, you're gonna find that, you know, you're, you'll stay in the area, but invariably you're gonna shift off a little bit, one way or another. Um, what, what I used to do when I had the one anchor system on my boat is I had line guides on each side of the boat. Uh, when we first got this boat, we only had a single anchor system in 01, and um, we had line guides on each side, the starboard and port. So in other words, if you were off direct to one side, you would cut the wheel, you know, the rudder, which would immediately make you crab over to one side, and you could adjust either way by turning your wheel to move you over, or instead of anchoring right off the bow of the boat, you're anchoring off the quarter. So you have a line guide on the starboard, another line guide a little further back, line guard on the port, another one a little further back. That'll allow you to shift one way or another. That's the cheating way to do it, the way we used to do it before we had two anchors. For those of you who want to try two anchors, if you've got a center console, it's easy enough to do because you have accessibility to the bow, and you can put two roads up there if you need to. With the two anchors, what you want to do is if you're going to lay 180, you want to run your starboard anchor first because that's the side you're driving on, okay? And you drop one anchor, say, if it's a 180 degree lay, you're gonna say, you're gonna go 50 degrees, so you'll go 230 degrees southwest. Drop the one anchor, turn the boat, allow the wind and jockey with the engine to get you over the piece again. Once you get over the piece, then you shoot up 180 less, another 50 degrees, which would be 130 to the southeast. Then you drop your second anchor. At that point, you're going to jockey with the two anchor lines to get yourself on a piece. So you're going to have a spread like this. When you have a good 100 degree spread like that, you're probably going to stay put pretty well. Of course, as Mother Nature generally does, the wind will shift sometimes during the day. What we ideally want when we bottom fish is a steady, fairly brisk 10, 15, not 20, not wind even. That's ideal because you'll stay put. And once you get the blackfish built, you know, you can stay on the fish like that a lot better, okay? So anchoring, you know, is a very important part of the game. The other thing is if, you, if you're swinging around a lot, what will happen is, you know, if you're not using the rod correctly, you're going to hang the bottom a lot more. The, the, the more still that you stay, the less rigs you're going to lose. And you know, when you start buying the jigs and you, the snafu rigs and the lead and everything like that, it gets expensive. So it's good if you can double anchor. Another way you can do it is you can, some guys will drop the one anchor off the bow and they'll come back and drop another one off the stern. That's a good way to do it too, but I've never done it that way because you know, once we got the double anchor set up off the bow, we, we were good like that. But that's another way you can do it. Or you can even drop one anchor off the bow and then just put a grappling hook in a piece. The thing about the grappling hooks I don't like <clears throat> is that you don't have as much flexibility as where to, to, to get the boat set up on the wreck. So we have one on the boat just in case. Hello? Oh, okay. Just in case, um, you know, we have an absolute zero wind condition. Uh, sometimes we'll go straight up and down on the wreck and grapple in. I've also caught blackfish drifting. It's an extreme situation, and we rarely, rarely do it, but every now and then it does work. So always be aware of your current, your wind, and the speed of your drift. Okay, when you're, when you're looking at a, at a bottom piece, uh, another important thing to do is you want to read your recorder. I assume most of you guys have color recorders. Um, you know, years ago we had black and whites. We, excuse me, we had paper recorders, believe it or not, way back. But the color recorders are pretty good in that you know, when I, when I see what I call color on a machine, like the, the blackfish are not going to read the, the way the striped bass do or blues or bigger fish. Uh, what you're going to read, what you want to read when you get on a wreck is you want to you read the life, the fuzz, the color, I call it. So when you look and driving around when you first get to a spot, you want to see that color. Invariably, nine out of ten times, you're going to see the color not on top of the wreck, you're going to see it on the sides almost every time, whether it's a wreck, whether it's the AB wall, uh, any kind of rock pile. Generally, when the bottom slopes down, that's where you're going to see your color. And that's usually where I like to fish. I like to fish on the sides of, of the high spots. 
Sometimes you'll be forced to fish up on top. What happens then is you're going to lose more rigs. Um, but I think all in all, and day in and day out, you're better off on the sides of the structure. Again, look for the color. I watch my machine all day long. Even after I'm anchoring and I start catching fish, you know, I say, this piece is lit up. You know, this is good. A lot of times it's bagals. But you got to realize when you're black fishing that bagals are part of the whole process. You need to have them. Now, I don't never camera the spot, which I would, I would like to do. But I, I can envision in my mind exactly what's going on down there. I can see when those baits drop down, the bagals are swarming around. They're picking the baits, picking the baits. That drives the blackfish to the bait. So you need that life chain. You know? The more life, the better. Eventually, if, you know, if things go the way they're supposed to, you'll build up the blackfish life. I'm a builder. I, don't, you know, I like to sit on a spot a while. I, I don't hit it and run quick. I like to sit there and build. Sometimes you'll be on a drop and you'll be catching and picking and I always say, well, you know, I'm not moving because there's just enough to hold me here. And then if I look at my tide chart and I say, you know, we got a tide change in another half an hour. Always wait that out because a moderate bite can turn into a massacre if you get a tide change. Sometimes the fish will be inspired by that and they'll bite really well. So always be careful when you move. I don't like to leave fish biting. You know, it's, it's, I've, I've done well over the years by being patient. And you do need to be patient sometimes. Okay, what I'm going to talk about next is I'm going to talk about tackle. Okay, I'm going to show you some stuff here. This is the outfit. Well, one of the rods I generally use. I'm going to take this off just for a second. This is a, a Shimano Travala. Uh, it's a, I'm going to tell you the model number here, TVC66MH, medium heavy. Funny story about this rod. Years ago, we first started black fishing, you know, and doing a lot of charters. In the, in the initial early stages, I did commercial fishing almost all, mostly, almost strictly. Once we got more into chartering, I needed a rod for the customers on the boat to come out. Guy came on my boat one day and he bought this rod with a small reel. I forget, it was a little Shimano reel. And when he came on the boat, I looked at him, I said, that's not beefy enough. We were fishing 17 at the time, you know, later in the season, fishing eight, 10 ounces, 12 ounces. And I was, I looked at him, I'm like, you know, I don't think that's gonna work. And this guy proceeded, and he's not that good a fisherman. He's not in here now, no, he's not. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and he put on a show with this rod. He caught a couple of 10 pounders, you know, Legitimate 10 pounders, not estimated. You know, I don't, I don't weigh my fish that way. But anyway, he put on quite a show that day with this rod. I'm like, holy shit, let me grab this one. <laughs> grab the rod. I said, wow. I said, it's light, but it's got good backbone. It's got good power. It was moderately priced. Back then they had a breakage warranty on it, which for me is excellent in, on, with my maniacs on the boat. So I bought a bunch of them, you know, and I've been using them ever since. They're great rods. It, you know, the rod itself, you could use so many different types of rods. What, what I will tell you what I like, I like something that's light in your hand, and especially when you get tendonitis in the elbow from holding the damn thing for so much in your life, you know. Uh, but you need that power also. You need to be able to set the hook on a fish. The blackfish, you know, we use these gamakatsu hooks now, which are quite sharp, but still, they have a jaw like leather, you know. It's a fish that you really need to kind of sink that bob into, you know, uh, so I like a rod with, with some good power. Also, a lot of times you're going you're gonna to need to use some lead, you know. So this is a great all-around rod. This particular reel, um, I mean, you can use a number of different rods that are similar to this. Basically, you want it to have a good backbone. You want it to be pretty light, pretty strong, and have SIC guides, silt and carbide guides, so you can use the braided line that we use. Um, the reel, again, there's so many reels you could use. This is a a Daiwa Sea Line, I believe. No, Saltist, I'm sorry. This is a Saltist. Uh, it's a pretty nice reel. It's small and it's light. Um, I have different reels on the boat uh, for my customers. Uh, we have the Shimano 1530s. Uh, it's a star drag reel. But again, almost any medium to medium light reel is going to work. I don't like going crazy heavy with these things. I feel like the, the lighter it is in your hand, the better. You get better feel with it, and it's more enjoyable. 
You know, you can, I can fish up to 10, 12 ounces, even 14 with this outfit. Okay, uh, the line. We use braided line. I like to use um, the uh, test. I'm going to say minimum 50, and I like to use 65. Excuse me, when it comes to Power Pro, which a lot of people use, the Power Pro 50 does not have good braking strength. Um, it'll break before the braid. What you want in this system is you want <clears throat> a braid that when you hang the bottom, because you're going to hang the bottom, when you try to pull out, you don't want your monofilament leader to break. I'm sorry, you don't want your, your braid to break. You want the monofilament leader to break. So what I do is the way I tie it, okay, um, I just all bright the braid, the mono into the braid, okay? Now I'm going to show you how to do that right now because this is a knot that a few people really know how to tie properly. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this and retie this one so make it easy. This is 50-pound um, fluorocarbon on here. You can use 50 or 60. You don't want to use more than that because if you use like 80, your braid will wind up breaking first, and you don't want that. You want the mono to break. What will happen here is, um, well, you know what? Let me get into the, to the connection first, then we'll get into that because that's important too. But Hooked up. So, you know what? Years ago, I, I, it was one of those things that I didn't do in my life that I should have. There's a lot of things, but one in particular. The fisherman's alarm clock. What better alarm clock than a, than a ratchet going off? Am I right or wrong? I never did anything with that. I should have. I probably would have made a lot of money. I probably would be standing here right now. I'd be down in a, in a Keys retired or some shit like that. So, okay, I'm going to cut this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass this around, though, just to, so you guys could see the connection, how tight it is. This one's a little, a little worn, but you'll get the idea. So just pass that around. You'll see what that connection looks like. Some of you poor old guys might not be able to see that. You might need your reading glasses or something like that. Believe it or not, I do not wear reading glasses, which is remarkable, really. But God gave me other maladies, so nobody gets away scot-free. All right, so what I'm going to do with this setup, I'm going to show you how to tie this. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm doing first, and, and this, this, I call this an Albright. Some people may call it something else. So I get the line. I'm going to maybe double about three, four inches. I'm going to pull it to a point. I want to squeeze that point a little bit, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay. Passing that around. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Now, it's important that you see that because you see... What a small knot that is. I see a lot of guys tie different knots than that. And I'm going to tell you, that's the best one. I don't care what anyone says. It passed through the guides easiest. And strength, I jigged 100-pound tuners. Many, 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 many tuners that size with this knot. So it's strong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the line through the loop like this. Knot tying is, is memory, but it's also finger control. That's probably the toughest part of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I'm going to go one, two, three, four. From bottom to top, put it through here. I'm going to cinch it. Here's the important part. You can't just pull this and cinch it. It won't cinch. What you got to do, pull one end. Pull another end, first end again, second end again, that's it. Then, uh, these are a little older, these scissors, so once these braid scissors, and then, you know, my meathead mates sometimes, they cut mono with them and what I like to do is just use them just to cut braid. Sometimes they cut crabs with them, and then the blade just goes to hell, but they're not all that expensive, and then I just trim it tight. You want to trim it as tight as possible. 
So again, transition through the guides, important. There it is. That's it, same thing. And you can just cinch it up. But again, I have, I've, you know, I use this when I bass fish sometimes, you know, um, when I um, jig the tunas, you know, uh, we use braid now and we jig the tunas, and this, this is a great knot, it works fantastic. And it passed through the guides quite easily, so. That's a good knot to, to learn. Um, okay, next thing we're gonna do. So I'm using fluorocarbon on here, you don't have to use it. Um, you know, it, it's a kind of a comfort thing with me. I feel like, you know what, if I can get an edge, why not have it? Doesn't cost that much extra, you know? And years ago, we tuna fished. We caught tons of tuna without fluorocarbon. But then once we got the fluorocarbon, I think it, it helped increase our catches. Now I won't, use, I won't fish without it. What we're going to do here is I'm going to show you this whole rig here. Now we have to retire this. Okay. It's pretty simple, really. It's just a dropper loop. And then we're going to tie it. We're going to put the rig onto the drop loop. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, when I get done with this, I'm going to pass the rig around to you. Um, last year, we did give the rigs away. This year, Vince wanted me to give the jigs away. We're going to talk about the, the jigging also. So we're going to do is we're going to tie a dropper loop. Okay, we're going to use about a foot of line. One, two, three, four five, maybe six times. And we're going to catch the middle of, of this and separate it. And we're going to put this through here. You can tie a drop loop a number of different ways is the way I tie it. And pull tight on it. And there's your drop a loop, okay? So, but here's the important part. As opposed to tying some kind of really strong knot on the bottom end for the sinker, all I'm doing here, overhand knot, that's it. Some people would argue with that. They'll say, well, you know, how come you're tying such a weak knot on the bottom? I'm doing that intentionally. I want that to break. Why? Because nine out of ten times you're going to hang the sinker, not the hooks, okay? If you're fishing on artificial bottom, man-made bottom, which is most of the bottom we fish on, you're going to hang the sinker in there. It's got to happen. Okay? When that happens, theoretically now, this will slip, and what you'll be left with is just a piece of line here with the dropper loop. Gets too close, snip it, tie it up again. A leader, a 10, 15-foot leader, will last me a couple of weeks sometimes, depending on the skill level of the guy who's using a rod, which in my case a lot of times is not so good. But like if I'm using it, it'll last me longer than that. But anyway, okay, so this is what we have here right now. And that's very close, right? That's intentional. I want that bait down as close to the bottom as possible. I don't want it sitting up here. We're not fishing the North Shore yet, okay? We're fishing in an area that I know this rig works quite well. So now at this point, we're gonna take this rig and we're just gonna loop it. So what you'll notice about this rig and your sinker goes here. See the way it stands off? Okay. I, I could not possibly estimate how many fish I've caught this way. It, it, it would be literally impossible. But this is a deadly, deadly rig. Okay. Um, it's simple. There's no hardware on it. And it's effective. And... The, the rigs themselves, you can purchase these rigs. I'm going to pass one around to you. The kid that used to work deck for me, Kevin, you know, he passed, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. He made these rigs. Myself and my friend Glenn developed those many, many years ago. Uh, it's called a snafu rig. So just pass that around. That's 60-pound fluorocarbon on there with a couple of gamakatsu hooks. It might even be... Imitation gamis on there, I'm not sure. Uh, they, they work quite well also. The gamis get quite expensive. Um, those hooks are sharp. 
Uh, the double hooks allow you to fish a whole bait and snafu to bait, uh, which I'm going to show you in a little while. So yeah, I, like I said before, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm probably the only guy you've ever seen do a lecture with live bait. You know, unfortunately, I've got to exterminate a couple of crabs, but this is the savage balance of nature that I deal with every day <laughs> in my life. You know? Any tree huggers in here? Peter people? No. We're not even going to get started with that. Are you going to edit that out, Ralph? No. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, so you've seen the rig. Um, you can get those rigs at Bay Park. Um, Mark sells them over there. You can make them yourself. It's a little tricky to do. Uh, if you know how to snell hooks, it gets a little bit easier. Personally, the one thing that I don't do is snell hooks. All my mates are very good at it, so... I allow them to do it and then just put the rig together from there. But um, you could use a single hook rig too. It doesn't really matter. That's, I think that gives you more of an edge because you can fish the double bait, uh, the double hook into the bait a lot easier, especially if you're fishing a larger bait. Okay, so we're going to get a little dirty here now. Mm, I should have bought a, a rig or something. Oh, I got a couple of these. So far I'm not blowing my nose that much, so it's not so bad. Okay. All right. Son of a bitch, they're still alive. You can edit that out, Ralph. They are. Look at that. Unbelievable. All right, so let's go and get a, a small one for now. Just to... So what we're going to do here is what I like to do when I, when I take a bait is I like to break the two big claws off, okay? You know, I, I don't know what it is. I... I to me, those big claws are their weapon, you know, and I, in my twisted mind, my over-analytical mind, I feel like, well, thank you. Oh, thanks, paper towels, too. Um, I feel like, you know, well, first off, these suckers will bite you. So it's good to get the, the weapons off right away, that, and from that respect, too. Um, I just like to, out of habit, take the two big claws off one, two, and just pull them inward, and they snap right off, usually. Okay, yeah. All right, and then I take the hooks. What I do is I'll start at the top. I'll work my way down. I hear it, Now, you'll hear a click when it goes through the, the leg socket, okay? One hook in that way, then I spin the other one around. I usually start from the bottom and work up on this one. I don't have to go right in the socket. I can go a little close to the socket also, and it still works quite well. So I'll put this in there. And you see how I wiggle the crab with my left hand? And then hear a click. That means when you hear the click, that means the bob went through. That's what you want. You want those bobs exposed. You don't want the, the hook in the crab so that the bob is not exposed because this way you'll get a better hook setting potential. And I see a lot of guys... We'll take the hooks and some good fishermen, put it through the back, straight through the belly. I like to do it this way, and I'll tell you why. Because now the bait is anchored, okay? If you just put it through the body of the crab, there's, there's nothing in the middle of the crab of structure to hold that bait on the hook. What happens when a blackfish hits it? Okay. And then when I send this down, by the way, I just tap the shell a little bit just to loosen the juice a little bit, Okay. So what happens with the blackfish is that, and, and I picture this in my mind, when you drop a bait down, you're going to feel the bite. You're going to feel the bites, invariably. You're going to get bagels, you're going to get blackfish, this, whatever. You're going to get bites. So when it drops down, um, you're going to feel them in it. And then once you get the, the feel of what a blackfish bite is and what a bagel bite is, you'll know, okay, that's a blackfish hitting it. You will rarely ever hook that fish when he first hits the bait. I am like ridiculously patient with the bait. I don't swing easily on a blackfish, okay? Um, I believe they come up to the bait, they rip the legs off, they crush it, they examine it, they circle around it. And a lot of times I'll wait and the rod will be bouncing and people look at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, you know, what I believe happens is they crush this bait up good, okay? And then at that point, it'll split in half a lot of times, okay? So there are two remnant pieces on each hook. 
When they come back for what's left of the crab, that's when you generally hook them. That's why it's crucial to get those hooks in the anchor area of the crab. Because if you put it in the crab itself in the soft part, it'll crush it. You, know, you see these teeth on these things. They'll rip that bait and steal it in two seconds. You know, when I see a guy constantly not catching anything, I see everybody around him catching. You know, I'm, I know he's probably doing something wrong. So I'll watch him bait the hook. I'm like, well, you know, you, you're, you're basically begging this fish to steal your bait. You know, this is not a sea bass we're dealing with. This is not a porgy. This is not a, you know, a, a ling or, a, you know, a fluke or anything. This is a blackfish. This is a wily critter. He's got a tiny little brain in there, but in most cases, he's got more fishing intellect than you do. So you've got to think better than he does. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, now we get to the bottom, all right? We got the bait hook properly. We get to the bottom. I'm going to show you the most important thing right now. And this right here is probably worth the price of admission. When people come out on the boat, the, the most frequent mistake they make is they just don't hold the rod correctly, okay? So what I mean by that is, all right, you, you're in, on the South Shore where I am. Um, the North Shore, you're not going to disregard this, but it's not as important when the water's flatter. What you want to do is you want to keep that bait still on the bottom. Okay, watch the sinker, right? So it's still on the bottom right now, right? See how the sinker's flat? What you don't want to be doing is this, okay? First of all, when you do this, your sinker is going to move around the bottom, okay? When I first drop to the bottom on this artificial bottom, the first thing I do is when I first drop to the bottom, I lift up just to make sure I'm not hung. Once I realize I'm not hung, and I'm not wedged in, at that point I've got my resting place, okay? You don't have to worry about shifting it around the piece. They're gonna find you. You don't need to find them. They will come to you, okay? So once you get that bait down to the bottom, at this point you wanna keep that bait still. You wanna keep that sinker still, all right? The way to do that is not to clutch the rod like this, like you would for sea bass or fluke or any other stupid fish. You want to clutch the rod, and not clutch the rod, you want to balance the rod on your hand. So what happens when the boat shifts up? I, I, I can't do it here because I'm not on a rocking boat, but I want you to envision this, all right? If you hold it like this, when the boat goes up and it goes down, it's pivoting on your hand. It's like, it's like a seesaw. You, Kevin, my old mate, used to hold it like this. And when a boat would go up and down, up and down, it would be like that. When I got my good guys on a boat, and these are guys I've trained since they first started fishing, you'll watch the tips of their rods. They're like this, constantly. In a, in a random motion, it's not steady like this. It's an, they flex to the, mo, to the movement of the boat. That's the most important. You got me all tangled here, Ralph. Okay, they flex to the movement of the boat. That's the most important thing. Keeping that sinker still on the bottom, okay? That's the hardest part of it right there. Then, of course, there's another difficult part is the hit and timing the hit. A lot of people, they will get this and they will keep the bait still, but they just don't swing at the right time. That's something that you develop a feel for that, and that's just trial and error. But what I said before, I would say wait longer than shorter, okay? What I like to do is I look at the tip of the rod. If the rod's doing this, if it jumps, that's a blackfish. If it's like this, that's a bagul. Tug. A, a tug is a blackfish. What you don't want to do and what you'll rarely hook a fish is, when you one tug, you'll rarely hook one like that. Very, very rarely. They'll always come up to the bait and play around with it and then take it later. Occasionally, a big one, an aggressive big one, will take the bait in one swipe, but most of the time they play with the bait. What I will look to see is a series of bites. First series, I don't swing. Second or third sw series, sometimes I'll swing. The series means you get one, two, three, one, uh, they start doing this, three, four good tugs in a row, that's when you lay into them. What I do is I, I'm like this when I'm waiting, okay, when I get the right bite and I feel like I'm gonna swing, I'm like this. My right hand is right here, okay? I swing up, set with my left hand, and I take the slack up with my right and instantly. 70% of people, 
even guys that know how to fish a little bit, what they wind up doing is they'll, they'll hold the rod and they'll switch hands before they turn the handle. They give them that one to two second delay and all of a sudden they drop the tip and I see the slack and it's like, oh my God, you got to stop doing that. Drives me nuts. A lot of times they'll catch the fish, but you know, we want to do this efficiently. We want to put the odds in our favor, not in the fish's favor. We want to swing up and reel at the same time. One motion, no slack. Works much better, okay? And swing hard. I like to push that hook in. I know there's a couple of guys, one of my, one of my buddies, Glenn, a commercial fisherman, very good fisherman, doing it probably as long as me. He has a guy that comes on his boat that gives the fish a slow lift. And he says, it's remarkable how this guy catches fish. I wasn't trained that way. I didn't train myself that way. Um, that's the way I do it. That's what I would suggest, okay? You could try that slow lift method. I've never really done it with success. But the main thing there is, um, is the way you're holding a rod. You don't want to lift that sinker on the bottom. You want to keep it still, okay? Back when we had one anchor, a lot of times we had to fish in free spool. Because what was happening was the, the boat was shifting so much, in, in order not to change our resting place, we had to let line out. The boat's shifting all the way this way, okay? And then all of a sudden the boat comes back. It's like coming close again. You know, we did it the hard way years ago, and then the boat's going to shift this way. So we're going to let out again. And then, so that's, again, the most important thing. The timing is something you'll develop after a while, if you keep doing it and doing it. But, but the, the way you hold the rod is ultra important. So, okay, what we want to do is, there are certain conditions that we want to avoid. Um, one of them is like an, a hard easterly wind. You know, if you get the first day of an easterly, you'll generally catch the fish when it first moves in. But if, you had blow, if it's blowing east all day and you're thinking about going the next day, you might want to rethink it. They generally don't bite after a hard easterly like that. The other thing is a, a substantial southerly wind. You know, those are our two bad winds. Why? Look at the, the geography. Long Island, New York is a bite. You know, westerly wind, you got New Jersey to block the sea from building. Northerly wind, you have Long Island to block the sea from building. Easterly... I guess you got England or something. You, you got something in Europe. That's a long goddamn distance. So that way those seas are going to build up. So you got to know, you got to know the way the, the, the land is, is set up. You know, it's very important. Swells and rolls. I notice it's getting worse, it seems, because I think there's more crap on the bottom in the ocean now, uh, more sediment. And what happens when that, when the waves and the sea builds up and it crashes, um, it, it stirs up the bottom down below. And once that sediment gets kicked up, it gets real cloudy. I've spoken to divers about this, and they tell me when it clouds up like that, it gets pretty bad. And the fish just can't see. They just go off the feed. Not only that, there are all other theories that people say. We're all scientists in the fishing uh, business, by the way. <laughs> we always say, well, me analytical that I am, you know, you try to find, well, why aren't they biting today? You know, well, it's probably sand in their bellies or something like that. They just don't feed. They're there because they live there. Blackfish, they live in these spots. They just don't always bite. So you want to avoid those two different types of winds. Aside from the fact that you're going to get your freaking butt kicked, you know, and nobody likes to do that. I mean, me, I, I don't have any choice. Sometimes I have to. But I'll usually try to talk to guys after fishing after rough weather like that. Doesn't seem to affect striped bass so much. Sharks, even tunas for that matter, but the, the, the blackfish, you know, they, they're first on the list. Fluke generally don't bite too well from that either, but the blackfish in particular do not, uh, do not bite well when you have situations like that. Um, I mean, I don't think there's really anything else I can cover as far as the, oh, you know, we're, we're going to go on the jigging now. This is, this is going to be a new one for me, by the way, guys, the jigging. We just started doing that the last couple of years. This year I did it more than I've ever done it. And I actually started getting pretty good at it. So I'm gonna, I didn't feel justified to lecture about it last year, but I think we can talk about it this year. So let's, uh, let's work on this now.
And we're going to have a question and answer period afterward, too, just so you know. But if you guys have any questions now about, about this setup, you know, feel free to ask. You know, and then I'll put it, pass it around later, you know, for a, a bulk questioning session. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. I just a question about the old right nine. Uh-huh. You make the old right nine, and you, you know, you say to yourself, oh, you know, you're not too sure about, you know, the, the hidden purpose. Would a drop of, like, um, you know, uh, crazy glue or something? Uh, I've heard people weaken, have. Weaken the power flow? I don't think so. I've never done it. Or the fall carbon or I, I've never done that, but I think it might be, it, maybe it'll help case, tra yeah. transition. But I honestly, and I'm going to knock on wood here. I know, I better not say it. <laughs> You know what I'm going to say, though. Yeah. Okay. But again, remember, I tuna fish with that knot. Yeah. So when we jig, so like they, so they pull a whole lot harder. Well, yeah, but you like it, but, you know, I haven't seen too many people that tie it exactly the way I do. Yeah. Most people, they double it, you know, they, and, but the way they do it, it, it makes the knot too bulky, yeah. Yeah. you know, in my opinion. Yeah. So um, that's the way I like to do it. But, yeah, I don't think it would be any... Any uh, detriment, honestly. Okay, anything else? And we'll open it up again later, guys, if you have any questions. So what we're going to deal with right now is we're going to deal with this jig. And now, I, I started... How are we run on time, Ralph, by the way? Holy shoot. Yikes. All right, we're going to have to hustle here. Um, all right, we're going to touch on the jigging right now. Um, these jigs that I have here are the backwater jigs. These are excellent also. This is an older one that I've got on here just for... Uh, illustration purposes. What you want to do with the jig um, is you want to set it up on a rod that's um, this is a Shimano Sojourn. It's nothing fancy. It's a graphite. It's a six and a half, seven foot rod like a medium light action. Uh, the reel is a Tsunami. It, again, it doesn't have to be anything in particular. A decent quality reel, a decent quality rod, graphite preferably, light preferably. Because again, light is right when it comes to this kind of stuff. Braid, I got 30 on here. Um, you can use 20. I've heard guys have better success with the 20 because it allows you to fish a lighter jig. <coughs> the leader, <coughs> excuse me, again, all brighted into a piece of 30 pound fluorocarbon. All right. Now, the jig, uh, basically, this is a one ounce jig. Um, I think it's a number three hook on here. Uh, these jigs here, are one and a half, one and a quarter, one and a half. What I like is the jig that's shaped this way. So when the jig gets to the bottom, okay, it kind of sits straight up and down like that. You see that? The hook is straight up, okay. That's why it's shaped like that. Now, what I want to do with this is I'm going to bait a little bit differently. I'm not. Most of the time, I'm going to use a whole crab unless it's a real tiny one. If I get a real small crab, I'll hook the whole crab through, okay, just on one side of the crab. If not, I will take a quarter of the crab or a half a crab, depending on the size. Okay, this is a white crab, deadly little buzzard. Um, but uh, this crab, a crab this size, I will cut all the claws off, all the arms off, shell the crab, Okay, and just put, a, put the half a crab on this size. If it's a really big crab, I'll put a quarter of a crab on. I'll use the socket, same way, bait it like that, and I'll set it down to the bottom. Now, you need to use a jig that's heavy enough to deal with the current. That's why I say this is 30 on here. I think you can go to use 20. You know, I know a lot of guys that do. I wouldn't use probably more than 40 pound leader on it. Again, we want the leader to break if you hang. Believe it or not, with these jigs, you would think that you lose a lot of them, but you really don't. You actually lose less of these than you do uh, the snafu rigs. Why? I think it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, let's get a sinker for you. Okay. You look at, look at a sinker, and I mean, this is a regular bank sinker, but other sinkers too, even the flat sinkers. They're less liable to hang but there's a lot of edges and stuff on the sinkers which tend to hang the bottom a little bit more. Whereas the jig, you can see this one, the paint's almost worn off. It kind of sneaks through the rocks and the cracks and stuff like that. And they come out actually quite easily. Um, so 
Um, I like to try to get away with um, as light a jig as possible if I can. But generally it's going to be, I find like the one and a half ounce jigs are pretty good. You know, in the, in the 60 foot or below level. Even I fish out at 17, I'll sometimes I'll use these jigs. Not often in that deep water. Um, on a windy day, they're a little tricky to fish. Because what happens is the, the wind catches your line and, and pulls it, which will pull the jig a little bit. When I drop this jig to the bottom, the way I drop it is this way. I open the bale, I point the tip of the rod at the water, and I let it pull down like that. A good thing to do is you're fishing in a certain area. You think you're going to be fishing there a while. Once you hit the bottom, put a little mark on your, your braid. It'll tell you, give you an idea. Because a lot of times guys put these jigs down, and even myself too, you're not sure if you're on the bottom. Like, am I on the bottom? It's, it's tricky to read. You just want to make sure that the line, the line will be spinning out like this, spinning out, and all of a sudden it stops. That means usually means you're on the bottom. But you want to make sure you contact the bottom. When you get to the bottom, the way I fish these jigs is, again, you are not actually jigging it. You're not actually jigging. Why is this not hanging? What you're basically doing is you're going you're gonna, to um, hold it like this, just the same way you're holding the, the bait rod, okay? So you, you're not moving it. You're keeping it still on the bottom. The jig is not really a jig that you're going to move it. It's basically just another pre presentation for the bait. I have had days where I've actually caught better on these jigs and bigger fish. Like if I'm getting a lot of small fish, I'm releasing, releasing, releasing. It's like, you know, i got to try to get a bigger one. I'll throw a jig down a lot of time. Not only that, but when you catch one on a jig, it's a hell of a lot more fun than on a conventional. It's challenging, okay? Um, and the difference is that you know, we're, we're on a bait outfit, you're waiting for the bites, the tugs, you know, and then you're going to set up on a series of tugs. Well, with the jigs, it's a little different. You don't set up, or I don't set up, until I see the bait moving or the, the line change direction. What you want to do with, with these things is you want to wait for the fish to pick the bait up and swim off with it. When you, if you see the straight up and down with your line, all of a sudden your line goes like that, and was moving steadily, that's when you want to set up. The problem is the fish doesn't always hit it that way. They'll tap it, tap it, tap it, you know, chew it. They won't pick it off and run off with it. It's harder to hook a fish with the jig than it is with a conventional, no doubt. But the positive part is that it's more enjoyable to catch them. If you're catching a lot of small ones, you know, if you're going to throw them back, at least you might as well have some fun doing it, you know, and you'll, ha you'll find it's much more enjoyable with these rods. Um, I'm starting to use these a lot more now because the last two years I've noticed a decrease in size in the fish and the average size of the fish. So now, you know, okay, if we're not going to catch a lot, a lot of keepers like we used to, at least let's have fun catching 15s and 14s and whatever, you know. And these jigs provide that. And again, there are days, I had a day off Long Branch, New Jersey. If you didn't have that jig down there, you were not catching these fish. It was a damnest thing. The day before we fished, we beat them up on the snafus. The next time we went, we fished. We could not catch them. Could not get them going on the bait rigs, on the conventional rigs. Started using the jigs and clobbered them. So there, it's a nice option. I wouldn't leave the dock without these now. Okay? And, I mean, it's, it's not an expensive outfit you need. You, again, you don't need anything fancy. You know, those of you who have the money, you want to get a Stella, that's your business. I got crazy guys that come out of my boat like that. Like, you don't need that rod. It's ridiculous. You know, you could, you could go with a lot of different outfits that will be effective. Make sure any of my mates are in. Okay. Um, so, um, again, this is, if, you, if you're using a quarter crab, um, that's an effective way to do it, a half crab. If you're going to use a whole one, make sure it's a real small one, silver dollar size or smaller, a half dollar size like that, and you'll find that you'll, you'll be able to hook up a little bit better with them. And the, the type of braid you use doesn't really matter. Um, just make sure that your leader is not a lot heavier than your braid. You know, if you're using like 20 or 30 pound braid, don't be putting 60, 80 pound leader on there. Because then every time you hang, you're going to break your braid. What do you got to do when you break your braid? You got to tie that knot again, that all braid. 
I could tie that all right in 30, 40 seconds. Most people can't. So you want to make things easier. Now, another way you could do it, you could tie a little barrel swivel on there too. You can do that. Your preference. I like to just tie direct. No, no metal, no swivels. But the barrel swivel works too. So you can do it that way also. These jigs, I'm not sure who made this particular jig, probably a buddy of mine down in Jersey, but I got these backwater jigs recently, and I got to tell you something, I am dying to try these out this year. I know guys who use them quite well on them, and I'll be passing you out one of these uh, for each of you on, on the way out. Um, but uh, they're great. He sells them over at Bay Park there. Size, I'm going to say overall best size, an ounce and a half. That's what this one is right here. You can go up to two ounces. Uh, I think he probably threw a couple of twos in there. I don't think I have any here right on here. No, that's, an ounce. that's a two right there, yeah. So that's a two, that's a one and a half. The hook size is the same. He's got a number four hook on there either way. But I'm, I kind of like doing this now. When I got a light crowd, if I only got a couple of people on the boat and I want to stir things up a little bit, I'll drop a jig down and, you know, and the guys will come over. And now, you know, I've taught them this way to do it, and I want to try to teach a lot of my guys the jig the jig method, you know. Um, I got to tell you, the, the best way to learn how to catch blackfish, and a, a, you know, a lot of my cuffs, customers will tell you this, is come out on a boat and stand next to somebody who really knows how to do it because there's no substitute. I could explain this to you, but, you know, I'd say it's safe to say that aside from a few women who are just they're like sponges when it comes to learning shit, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, most people will have a hard time doing it. The other thing is, if you don't have good sea legs, it makes it harder. If you can really balance yourself, like I got stainless ball bearings in my hips so I can just kind of like roll around like this and, you know, no problem. But, you know, if you're stumbling a lot, you're, you know, that, that's a big part of it. I always tell people, put your knees up against the gunnel. My gunnels are high on my boat, It'll brace you a little bit, and then you can... You know, if your body's still, your lower body still, it makes it easy to do this. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about sea bass, okay? Easy fish to catch. One of the dumbest fish in the ocean, no question about it. Um, I'll give you a couple little tricks. The rig I use, and it's kind of based on the whole blackfish rig. Uh, basically what it is... Mm -mm -mm -mm. Number three, number four, you know, hook size is not all that crucial. Okay, what it is? Yes, sir. Basically, bow swivel on top, two dropper loops. You've got a small connection down here. That's, say, 50 pound, the top part. The bottom part is 30. Why do I want this on the bottom of 30? I want, if I'm going to hang, I want to lose the sinker. I don't want to lose any of it, but... I'd rather lose the sinker than the rig. I lose the sinker, and then I just take this, put another short length of mono on, and there you go. It's a quick fix. This way, this rig is the top part of it's still intact. Give you one quick point on, on the sea bass. Uh, drifting, you'll generally catch bigger fish. Um, use clam bellies on the hook if you can get a hold of them, and thaw them the day before. That's very important. Um, they're a little less expensive and they're very effective. Um, pretty easy fish to catch. Uh, they need to lower the size minimum. It's ridiculous at 15 inches. And I could talk till I'm blue in the face, but the DC will never learn. Um, basically, they're forcing fishermen to catch 100 or 150 fish to keep enough to make a day, which makes no sense to me. Why not lower the limit to 14, 13, allow people to catch their limit a lot easier instead of having to go through so many damn fish? Because you know they get gut hooked a lot. I've said my two cents mm -hmm. on the sea bass regs. Um, anyway, any questions, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Like, say I was going to come out on your boat and uh -huh. make a reservation two months in advance. Mm -hmm. What am I looking for? Time of day, tide, things like that. But how would I pick a day? It's time of the season. Uh, I suggest weekdays as opposed to weekends. Why? Less boat traffic. You know, I can get my, you know, my best location, you know, weekends, a lot of times I got to take what's left. 
You know, I'm not going to run out in the middle of the night to beat some of these psychos out there. So, I mean, I've got a ton of bottom, but, you know, weekday's best. Blackfish, spring, you know, it's all clam fishing. Um, not as good. Anyway, we're usually so busy bass fishing, I, I usually can't do those trips anyway. Best time is from October, late October, into mid-December. That's prime time. And... You know, again, if you can get a weekday, that's fantastic. And what will happen is that when you get off the boat, I will be in back of you the whole time watching you. I don't sit. Well, Ralph knows this. Some people hate me because I drive them crazy. But by the time you get off that boat, you're going to know how to catch blackfish a lot better than when you came on because I will make sure of that. Myself and my mate, um, we know how to do it quite well. We know how to teach. Okay, and, and once you pick that up, it's something that'll be valuable to you. If you've got your own boat, if you go on a party boat, you know, the people that fish with me over the years, they, they learned it the right way, and now when they go on a party boat, they're the guy that everybody looks at. And it's these little things that, you know, I'm, I don't know how other charter boats do it. I doubt anyone is as thorough and, and as annoying as I am when it comes to teaching people how to fish. But at the end of the day, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. So... Those, that's the period of time, that late October into mid-December. Well, you want to do a, a full day usually when you're doing that because that's, that's the best way to do it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I've had a tough time with sea bass where a peanut bunker works better than Yes, bait. yes. A big bait, a peanut bunker, or a chunk bait can work quite well. You know what? When you're catching shorts one after the other, which is you doing most of the time, switch things up. Lift the bait off the bottom. And, Don't and keep it on the bottom. You lift it up, yeah. Bait, yeah. Up switch, switch up on it, you know, and try a different bait. You know what else is great? A crab. A crab's a great bait for sea bass. You know, a lot, when you take them off the bottom and clean them, a lot of times there's crabs in them. A lot of times. Any other questions? Is that a wrap, Ralph? Okay. Thank you, Thank you guys. Appreciate that.